In the spirit of uh, alternating, as we said, the hacker stuff and the academic stuff, after yesterday's keynote about the last crack, today's uh, distinguished uh, keynote speaker is uh, Professor Angela Hesse from uh, University College London. She's head of information security there, professor in the Center of Security, and director of the UK Research Institute in the Science of Cybersecurity. She has a psychology background that uses it to give people PhDs in computer security. <laughs> and this is a very interesting combination. She's a pioneer of usable security with a famous paper with over a thousand citations called Users Are Not the Enemy. And we look forward to hearing from her. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Frank. Yes, so uh, what I want to talk to you today about is that users hate passwords. So are they on their way out? Uh, meaning, um, how many more uh, passwords conferences has Pierre got left to organize? <laughs> okay, so as Frank, uh, Frank kindly said, um, I've been um, looking, looking at passwords and the problems with passwords for nearly 20 years. The um, first study uh, I conducted with my PhD student, Anne Adams, uh, was in uh, in a big telecommunications company, it's no secret, it was BT, and it started with a phone call. Uh, I was working on, I was working as a usability person, but on something completely different. Um, the, the first generation of internet audio and video tools, and naturally that meant collaborating with telcos like BT. And so they rang me up and somebody said, um, you know something about usability, right? And I said, yes. He said, maybe you can help us with this problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, um, the accountants have started to complain about the cost of the help desks for resetting passwords. They traveled, the, co the number of people they, uh, we employ on the help desk has trebled every year for the last three years. And the accountants are saying, this can't go on, it's got to stop, do something. Um, and the idea of doing something was to ask me to run a quick study. And the brief for the study literally was, please do a quick study and tell us why these stupid users can't remember their passwords. That's how, um, how I got into this whole thing. So when we did the, the study and looked at it, um, the answer actually was, was fairly simple. Um, it didn't take us very long to find out. The answer was, is um, they, they are not stupid. You're asking them to do something that's not humanly possible. People can't have between 60, it was in this, this particular study, uh, 16 and 64 different passwords or pins, six digit pins, that are changed on a monthly basis and you're telling them they can't be the same and they can't write them down and whatever. It's just not possible. Human memory isn't built that way. Uh, and I would like to think that, that since that, um, that particular insight we have come along um, a bit and nobody is asking, is putting people into a situation where they have to do something like that. But I'm not so sure <laughs> that, uh, that in, in some situations. So generally, password expiry has, has been um, extended a little bit. And um, most, you know, very few places use six-digit pins because they've learned the hard way that that doesn't work. But actually, we found that, that almost 10, a bit more than 10 years on uh, when, when we looked at it is, so the one thing that, of course, significantly changed since the introduction of that paper was, uh, since that paper was the introduction of single sign-on. So that rapidly, um, so single sign-on and standardization of user, ident of user IDs. Well, with that, um, the problem got whittled down quite, quite a bit. But when, even when we look 10 years on, even in organizations that have single sign-on, people still had between seven and eight passwords, or six to eight passwords they had to use regularly. And they were still complaining that the time they had to spend on, on entering passwords is a significant uh, drain of productivity and that they felt it, it was um, disrupting them. And the uh, the other evidence that, that other colleagues since procured, what, procured was also that, pe that people, the users really try 
and help themselves in a way by using, reusing passwords across multiple accounts. You know, most passwords get recycled and used in more than one way. So people do that in order to increase the frequency of use to make sure they, as a way of trying to help them remember these, these passwords better. And that is, from a memory point of view, a sensible strategy. But from a security point of view, that's becoming increasingly less and less tenable right? because of the way that attackers work. Uh, I'll come back to that later on. Um, to stay on the, um, on the track is a few years ago with American colleagues um, funded by NIST, we did a study where we looked, where we took the time to, to, um, to use the technique we've, we used in various organizations before. To, uh, to basically ask people to keep diaries of all the authentications they had to make and then use that as a starting point to talk through people with all the kinds of things that happened. Um, and one of the, one of the things that, that we had previously observed that the amount of time people spent just authenticating in the course of a day and dealing with all the recovery that's associated when people forget passwords. Once you add that up, that really is significant time and effort. But in this study, we suddenly started to realize there are actually some additional effects that we hadn't understood before. Um, so the, um, the disruption of the primary task was something we had previously not really factored into the, the uh, effort. Uh, that's, that's basically that, that individuals use, individual users use, but also if these uh, people are employees in a company and they, but they do this in the course of their work, this is also time the company uses. And this is, so um, as, as you probably can appreciate, people need to authenticate, to log into various systems, but that's not their main job. They have a main job to do. And when authentication disrupts the primary activity that we do, until the NIST study, we hadn't actually appreciated, um, even though as a psychologist you might say I should have realized this before, if I'd, if I'd remembered my psychology from, from undergraduate school, is when somebody interrupts you at a point when you're doing your main task, you can't just go and resume immediately at the point where you got disrupted. What you need to do is you go like, uh, and where was I? And you're basically mentally, you're going back to your short-term memory and going trying to remember where you were before. And that can, the longer the interruption that was associated with the authentication task takes, the longer that pullback is. And what we discovered in the NIST study was that people had to redo about 40% of the work they had already spent on the primary task before they could get back to carrying on with it. Now, when you, when you add that time um, onto the time that people are just spending on authentication, the figures become truly staggering. So um, I've previously, when, I, when I've talked about this, I said in companies I've studied, people spend up to 30 minutes a day of, uh, with authentication-related tasks. You know? And if you go to the management of a company and say, do you realize your employees spend 30 minutes a day? That's three weeks a year of, um, of, of time just logging in. Right, you suddenly go, they suddenly go like, that's, you know, that's a huge part, part of the productivity budget. And then they suddenly become a bit more interested in saying like, well, maybe we should look at the way our staff authenticate to systems. Maybe we should make this um, le easier and should make it less disruptive um, for them. So to get rid of what we called in, in this NIST study, the wall of disruption. So, um, but sort of one of the design decisions that I think previously um, the, the people who deploy this mechanism had never really thought about is that often you have flexibility about where the authentication occurs. And so the same, um, an authentication of the same workload placed somewhere um, placed in between two tasks where it doesn't disrupt a task is significantly less bad for the user than disrupting in the middle of a task when you then need to get back and reduce things. So there's, there's some ideas that, that we can pursue um, in future when we look at designing better, more seamless authentication, um, authentication tasks. Um, 
So in this, um, to come back to the title of the talk, um, the participants in our study basically, we asked them to, to sort the various um, the various uh, bad things they, they mentioned about authentication. And then we, so we compiled this hate list from it. Um, and number one on this hate list is, and what you start to realize here, is it's not just necessarily the password and the authentication itself, it's the combination with other security measures that the company puts in place that is causing this. So in this organization, right on top, was in the repeated authentication to the same systems. So this particular company had a 15-minute timeout. So if you hadn't touched the keyboard um, of one of your systems for 15 minutes, it would lock the screen and you had to re-authenticate again. And it was particularly bad if you weren't um, in, within the perimeter of the organization, if you were working from home or you were traveling, you not only had to authenticate to one system again, you basically had to decrypt. You had to get back into the machine, then you had to authenticate to the VPN and that you had to authenticate to the application that you were using. Right? <laughs> and so you can see you know, why people get, got, got started to get quite frustrated here. You know? And they would basically say, like, you know, I've, I've, I very often, you know, these were all knowledge workers, quite um, you know, people, people who often, you know, most of them with a very technical background, but they said, I've sat here for 15 minutes, I'm using two systems, right? I'm reading a specification on one system, and I'm programming on the other system, so you're moving. I sometimes sit and think, and, but um, I haven't moved for two hours, but <laughs> every 15 minutes, I still have to prove to the system that it's me, right? And, and this is where people go like, this is ridiculous, you know? And they end up like pounding the table, literally in our interviews, and saying, for God's sake, technology should be smarter than this, right? It shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't do this to me. The number two one is one that goes right back to users are not the enemy. It's something that we pointed out in there, is the passwords that you're using several times a day are not the main problem. Those passwords are only a problem when, they, when, you, have, when you change them in, in the days following the change. The ones that cause regular problems are the ones that people don't use frequently. So this is basically, you know, only, or maybe only a couple of times a month, and in some cases, uh, we've, had, we've, we've had people, you know, there's often systems maybe um, that the, for outside services that people only use twice a year, you know, fat chance. You can, um, you can, remember, um, you, you can remember that. If you've got multiple systems and passwords require frequently, people literally run out of ideas. You know, um, because a lot of thing, uh, systems are, they, you have a password checker um, that's, that kicks in, and you have a history mechanism. Um, in my organization at home, is that history mechanism even picks up um, if you only try and change one character of the password when you change it. Uh, and it's telling you, I'm sorry, this is not going to they encrypt on a per character basis. Hmm? No. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't encrypt passwords, would you? Uh, depending, yes, some people. You tend to hash. Hash, yes, yeah. hash and salt would be the proper, the proper way to do it. But yeah, go, you know, um, not, which not everyone does. If you've ever listened to Cormac Hurley's um, recent talks on this, you know, yeah, you wish, um, but um, a lot of them don't. So, so creating a valid password, you know, and the experience that the users then have is the system just goes no, 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 no. And it's not unusual. I mean, we've watched in our studies people sit there for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, trying to come up with a valid password the system will accept, right? And if you think about that, you can probably empathize that they, um, that they basically get um, a um, little bit, you know, a bit desperate. Some of you uh, may have, have seen this before. Yes, by the way, when you see this kind of humor, it's always a sign of the underlying, um, it's always a sign that there is a lot of pain underneath, right? People basically use humor as a way of, uh, of diffusing, of, of releasing the pain they, they experience. So um, a high number of credentials. So here in this organization, um, this government organization, we were looking at people still had multiple passwords. And then you, the, the, the memory workload starts to multiply because it's not just the password you have to remember. You then have to remember which password we're goes with which systems, and if there's, there's a difference in user IDs, then it, it adds another thing onto it. You know, every, 
uh, there's just so many things you can get um, can get wrong. Um, and in this organization, also some people complained about the use of, R of, of RSA tokens because they said, is, now the other thing I have to remember is, uh, is to bring this thing with me. And if I don't have it with me, I can't do anything. And that could, you know, I might have to drive another hour back home and then another hour back in. And that's a, that's a gigantic waste. Um, as you will see later on, however, um, in, in other organizations, I've seen they've replaced it with something else. And then people were pounding on the door and reminding the RSA token back because you can make it even worse than this. Um, so the long-term impact on productivity um, was, was, was basically okay, so the time's been wasted. But what we could see here in this organization is that people literally start to reorganize their work to minimize the exposure to authentication. So tasks that should be done on a regular basis end up being batched um, so they're basically to make the authentication worthwhile and then you do as many tasks behind it and go on. That may be okay in some environments, but in other environments where your service actually relies on you continuously serving customers and so for instance, um, it can actually create a problem. But we'd also had here, is literally there were in the office of the sysadmins, there were laptops piling up that people had returned and said, keep it, Why? I don't want it anymore. Uh, and this, this is admins would say, but then you cannot log in when you're when you're out traveling, and so and people are going, so everybody, so you can wait, you know, I'll do my email when I get back, um, but I'm not going through this like you know decrypting the machine, logging into the VPN, and then uh, authenticating to the thing again. It's just not worth it. Now basically now you can see what what productivity things are happening, and both in in this study and in another study done in. US government authentication where they looked at the common access card, the CAC card being introduced, they found there was a massive decrease in a, a number of hours being worked from home, the number of time that people logged in from home. And in both studies, it was calculated that the, the free lost, the free time the government was really was losing here from employees who actually love their job and were willing to work more goes into the hundreds of millions. Um, for arguably, uh, even more stunning was that, that people reported that they'd had some ideas and wanted to do, try something new and do something different, but then on reflection decided not to bother because they said security is going to nix this anyway. You know, they won't let us basically let these people onto the network. They won't give them, give these credentials. So, well, you know, I think uh, the quote from one of them was, we'll just muddle on. It'll, we'll get to the result. The result won't be as good and we'll get there a lot later, but I'm just out of time, of, of emotional energy, of fighting, you know, these, these restrictive security policies. I just can't take anymore. Um, if, if, any, if, if you've looked at the compliance budget paper we published um, in, in 2009, um, that's a good illustration of that. Uh, and in the worst case, we've seen this particularly in, 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 in trading environments, um, is that, that some, some people just leave, you know, and it's often the best people who leave, they say, who refuse to be tied, tied down what they see as over-restrictive policies and say, I can't really do, um, perform as well as, you know, as well as I want to here. I'll go somewhere else where they'll actually let me. So... Um, even if you'd, you'd be willing, if you'd say like, well, but security is important and if we lose that much productivity, so be it. Uh, the impact on security is also, um, is, is also not, uh, not really good. So what people do is, is, and what we've found in organizations time and time again, and that includes very, um, very secure environments you'd expect to be very secure, such as the military, what you find is that non-compliance, particularly with authentication policies, is very widespread and people just create um, a huge amount of workarounds and ways of, of, of getting um, around it. And that is bad news because those workarounds they do, the users themselves don't realize that it creates vulnerabilities and problems, but it does. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, in addition, I would argue it creates, creates you know, having rules that aren't being obeyed and, and where everybody realizes they aren't being obeyed creates a really bad security culture. You know, and one of the key things in the military for managing your staff is always never give an order that cannot be obeyed. 
Because if you, go, if you give one order that can't be obeyed, it, it reduces the, the power of all f uh, uh, orders you give from here in. It, it just blows your credibility. And finally, it's really bad for security because if you're trying to monitor uh, how well your security is doing and there's all this non-compliance going on that is non-malicious, it creates uh, a level of noise when you're looking on your systems or you're looking what's going on in your organizations and you know what, the attackers love this. They'll go like, we, fantastic, you know, we can hide in this. Um, it's a lot easier for, for, for them uh, when, that is, when that is going on. So that when people really just forget, when they do these workarounds and everybody does it, people forget that they're doing it. And I've got <laughs> close to 100 pictures and I've got dozens of videos of people really just forgetting um, what, they, what they've done. Um, and so you basically, this is um, from last winter's flood emergency warning broadcast on national TV. Username, emergency planning, password, winter 14. Well, that wasn't particularly, uh, particularly unguessable to start with, but uh, while we're at it, I think we'll throw in the web key as well, because um, you know, why, uh, why not? Um, and whether you do this in football, um, it's basically, it's, um, it's down here in, the, in, in that the, the Wi-Fi you know, password is World Cup. Um, also very, yeah, I really sometimes wonder when you see it's like, why bother having one in the first place if it's, um, if it's like that? And here is basically, so even in the military, you can see, see there is, we've, we've worked it out, so the Wi-Fi passwords are just written on there and, you know, reporters coming in, taking pictures of everything. Um, that is just very common. And if you've just been, um, if you're the chief executive of TV5, the French station, you've just had a major, major breach, you know, your, all your, your systems were compromised and take down, what do you do? You go on national television to explain what's going on, whilst your Facebook and Twitter passwords and all are behind you and again being broadcast on um, national TV. Right. That's um, so, but on the one hand, yes, you could, you know, you could turn around and say like stupid users, but this is really, that's the reality. That's ha that happens when people create these workarounds because there's no other way of managing it. And then that's what you do day to day and people just forget. So I think we'd really quite um, like to move on from that. And security people, we found, don't always practice what they preach. So if you remember the hacking team incident where, where that, um, that, that this company um, that, that makes, um, well, security products or spy products, depending where you are, get taken down, you know, they, their passwords weren't, um, weren't particularly good either. So the result really is, is in, it's an unfortunate place to be, is to most users, security is a joke. Um, and particularly passwords, the password policies they experience on a day-to-day -day basis are, are just a joke. Uh, and they, they disobey and nothing happens and the result is, is really we're in a pretty bad place uh, when it comes to, to security culture in organizations. And even when we, if we now start working and make security compliable, we're going to have a long, hard road to actually get back to undo all the bad habits that people have acquired as a result of just trying to cope with un um, unusable security. You know, things is when you, when you create a mechanism like this, you've got to keep on watching what's happening. We passed about three years ago the point where the majority of passwords are now entered on touch screens as opposed to on keyboards. And the usability people were actually quite quick to come out with the, stu with the studies to show that the entry time of the same password, if you've got a, um, a, pass a, a com 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 what we call a COMP8 password, um, so eight characters with a complexity of at least three character sets, uh, that the entry time uh, for even for a practiced user on a touch screen is three times as high as on a keyboard and the error rate goes up by a factor of three to five and basically the longer the passwords get the worse it um, it gets um, again colleagues from NIST did these studies and they produced the tables for it you can you can look it up right and you'd, you'd basically say like okay so the majority of people are now entering things uh, things this way 
um, how you know, we really need to adapt to, to this. So the current situation really is lose-lose, right? And if Wired, you know, this is already a couple of years ago, comes out and says, kill the password, um, <laughs> you know, you've got to be worried um, that's, um, that, that this is happening. And people are looking for other technologies. The FIDO Alliance is basically, uh, basically um, coming, uh, ramping up, and, and I saw them at the biometrics conference this year. They're very, very bullish about the growth they've experienced of providers um, Joining, um, joining them. Um, and I think, you know, basically looking, looking at those kind of, kind of solutions where effectively you, you're still building on some, some ideas of the architecture, but you do away with the mechanism as far as users are concerned. You make it easier is probably the way forward. I certainly think, I just want to very briefly say, I think that in the literature of usable security, there's some really crazy um, suggestions of, of allegedly more usable authentication um, that, that I just don't think are going to work. Yeah, Microsoft um, probably um, has come up, is actually guilty, is, is responsible for a few of them. So the authentication via Rorschach ink blot tests. I don't know if you've ever seen these things. They put like a symmetric ink blot in front of you, and psychiatrists normally use that. And depending what you see in them, their diagnosis. So they said, oh, you basically remember bits on, on the ink blot singing your password into the computer, um, or another Microsoft special, ringing up your friends in the middle of the night and saying, um, do you remember that code I gave you a few months ago? Uh, and you go like, no. <laughs> well, I need you to really go and find it because you need to verify it's really me so I can get back into my account. Right? That's going to make you really pop. So we're not just bothering the users. <laughs> they, they keep on calling me from Microsoft in, in India all the time. All the time, so yeah. <laughs> Maybe, maybe you can give your code to, to some of those guys. I'm sure they'd be pleased, pleased to help. Um, the other one was like, well, you should just, um, if we're talking about technology should be smarter than this, is you should just think your passwords. And I always used to hold this paper up as one of those other really crazy ideas. You know, you basically get, get a free EEG thrown in. Um, and this is a case where I was wrong because you can now for, for $300 or less get this, the Emotif helmet, which gamers use in order to bypass, not, the bypass the manual entry of anything. You just basically direct your figures around the screen by thinking about it. So this is a further development of assistive technology that's used for, for disabled people. Um, so maybe this one actually wasn't so daft after all. Um, you can just think it and the computer will recognize that it's the correct password. Um, meanwhile, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the world out there is, of course, is in large parts of the world, the bank, banking people moved on to tokens. Um, they're they're quite, quite widely used. But they are expensive. There's no doubt about it. You know, if you're, if you're providing, you have to provide this to, to, to ten thousands, hundred thousands of customers, it's a significant expense. And in, in the studies we've done and some American colleagues have done, is the answer is, um, you know, again, people don't don't, don't particularly like it. Because at the end of the day, what you're getting is you're just getting more stuff layered on top of the password, right? If they give you one of those, you don't get rid of the password, you still have a password, um, a password or a PIN. It just, you just generate yet another one-time password or PIN that goes with your standard password and PIN. And then when they layer other stuff on it, such as partial entry, you know, only give us the, you know, we want to have the third, the ninth, and the fifteenth character of your password. You know, that's again when people basically start pounding the table increasingly with their head and not just with their their fists. You know, because these are these are really uh, annoying and error-prone tasks that take significant amounts of time. So, not really much of an improvement. I think one of the most stunning implementations I've seen is it's the crypto card. You know, in principle, you'd think it's a nice idea, but if you implement it like these guys did. Um, which was that you basically have to enter your user ID and it generates an eight-digit PIN, which you enter into the card, and then the card gives you an eight-character password, which is valid for one minute, that you have to in enter back into the system that you're logging into. Right? And here is where the people who'd previously used the RSA token started hammering on the door and said, I want my RSA token back. 
quick test of how good are you in understanding workload is why? Why is, is it not the same to do this? Number one is why is it not the same as using, um, using the RSA token? It's more steps, yeah, number one. And, okay, but also there's one step that is, is with practiced use quite easy to do with the RSA token and it's very hard to do here. Yes, so reading off a six digit purely numerical code, you can read it off, rehearse it in your head once and in one, enter it in one go. And you can do that within a minute. An eight character complex string you can't read off in one go, so you end up like going back and forth and back and forth and that is, increases the likelihood of errors and uh, by the time you finally managed it, your one minute's probably over <laughs> and you need to start all over again, right? So it's nothing against the cryptocurrency principle, it's about how you implement it. Um, and the argument, like, you know, when I ask them is, so why did you, did you choose an eight character complex password? And the answer was, well, because we could. And surely that's more secure than a six digit type, than a six digit numerical code. And you're like, yes, but it's only valid for one minute. So <laughs> uh, the, six, uh, the six digit numerical code is perfectly good enough. Um, I just wanted to quickly highlight, of course, when it comes to token, Frank is trying to do the right thing um, as far as we're concerned, which is to have a token-based solution that doesn't mean the user basically still keeps all these ridiculous additional thing and it's just layered on, on one each other. Um, we want to actually really make it easy to use. So what is the competition out there? Um, and, and increasingly the noise is, you know, the, that what you hear rumbling in the background sort of coming towards us is, is basically it's the second coming of biometrics, um, as I call it. You know, we had a kind of like a false start in the early 2000s. Um, but now that's basically on its way back. Again, as with the crypto card, of course, it's, if you don't implement it properly, you can screw it up really badly. So, and they did in, in this case, you know, people were complaining about the password. They said, fine, have a fingerprint reader. Um, and about um, a quarter of, um, of, of the staff did. Uh, but then every 90 days, they had to start going <laughs> in their drawer trying to find that piece of paper where they'd written the eight, the, the eight character complex password on. Had to go and type it in, then they had to sit there and think up another eight character password uh, that they would never use except for like write it on the piece of paper to use again in 30 days time. And then, had to, then they had to re-enroll their fingerprint against it, right? And you go like, <laughs> Right. That is, uh, it's again, it's just, you know, that's just, cr that's just silly. So you go and if you're not willing to integrate the biometrics properly into what people are doing, there's really, there is no point. You can make it almost on a day-to-day -day basis. The fingerprint users were happier, but every time this happened, you can imagine, you know, they would, um, they basically like go like, you know, this is, this is um, just, uh, you know, and just as, uh, as, as, as angry as they get when they had to change for infrequently used systems, they basically had to go through this exercise um, some, some system, if, you, if you have a 90 day expiry window and you're using a system twice a day, you do the password change twice for absolutely nothing, right? You're just doing it to keep the password alive. And my, my argument is, is if you've got such infrequent use systems, you're better off giving people one-time codes, you know, don't even bother asking them to remember anything, it's not going to work. So, but back to the biometrics, fingerprint done better. Um, in, in, in the, the, the rumbling got considerably um, noisier with the introduction of the iPhone and, and the Touch ID on there. You know, that was with one stroke, six million users, six million biometric users. Um, and so far, it's been the Gen D experience over. It's been overwhelmingly good. And what you would expect from Apple is, you know, they just didn't stick with old dogma. When they implemented it, they went their own way. So traditional enrollment is you slap your finger down three times and then it calculates the template. And by doing their homework, they actually realized that's not, you know, you end up with templates that aren't particularly good. And they went, okay, let's make users spend a bit more time on the enrollment task i.e. you've got to put, put your finger down about 10 times in order to get proper coverage of the finger in exchange for then having a seamless um, experience later on. 
and that works. Um, they also decided to keep the pin alive, um, and that's a smart decision as well. There's nothing worse than if you say you have a backup, that's a pin. Uh, pins are forgotten even faster than passwords, so if you don't use it for a while, it's, it's just going to be gone. So uh, by, by effectively pushing the user, forcing the user to keep using the pin occasionally, they're keeping it alive, and that's a good idea. And there's all sorts of, so various banks have now come out um, and said, we're going to use the Touch ID here in the UK. Um, and um, in other ones are going with the, um, the face recognition on the phone. So this was Jack Ma of Alibaba at CBIT earlier this year in announcing his smile to pay system um, that Alibaba would be using. It's very much, we're all very interested because it means they must be using a different algorithm than was traditionally used because smiling is one of the things that messes up face recognition. Um, normally, so they must be using a deep learning algorithm to, to get around that. Interesting. On the other hand, I still think from a user point of view, this could be slightly tricky if you just feel you've just paid far too much for something and then you're being forced to smile <laughs> uh, in order to, to approve it. Oh, maybe that's a way of protecting yourself from spending too much money. I don't know. Um, so, but but there have been, you know, we're, we're still not really quite sure that the um, what, what's sort of quietly on the outside, behavior biometrics have been, have been making their way back. And to, to, to the surprise of many, actually their recognition rates are better of those than, than virtually all of, the, um, all of the static biometrics like fingerprint, um, face and iris. And that opens, of course, some, up some really interesting possibilities, right? If I can have a password, um, that, and it's quite a simple password, nobody cares if it's a word or, you know, it's, it's like, you know, the name of my dog and my kitten combined into one or whatever, um, then um, it, because in addition the system recognizes how I type it, now that's quite nice, right? You've got a one-step, two-factor authentication, and if it's reliable on top of that, ah, here we might be getting our smarter technology that people were um, demanding, you know, so rapidly. And suddenly, this problem that we have with entering the password on a touch screen, like the error rates and so on, if you just turn it around and say like, aha, uh -huh, I'm going to use the way how you mishit the keys as a way of identifying you, instead of as a, as a way of, we now have possibilities, right? So that's actually, I think, a good illustration of like by just sitting down and say, work with, you know, fit it with who is using this, on which device, in which circumstances, and finding a good fit. We can actually make this re you know, fairly quick and fairly smooth. Um, and maybe the password, the password isn't, you know, isn't that dead. Maybe it's just part of uh, of a new smarter solution. An interesting thing we discovered is, we, we, so we've been uh, doing various usability studies on biometrics, is that actually the password has one significant advantage, and that is that it re uses retain the feeling of control. So when we gave them this face recognition system on a phone, um, it doesn't really matter which system it is, it, 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 it just happened we tested this particular, um, this particular one. Um, that people actually said is, you know, it didn't, they experienced that it didn't always work. Um, and even if it does work, they don't understand how it works. And that made them sort of quite uneasy because they said, like, if I fail, I don't know what to do. If it's a password, I can type it again. Or if it's a captcha, you know, everybody hates it and complains about it. But if I fail, I, it's, you know, I know it's my fault and I'll, I'll, I know I can do it again. If I fail the face recognition, I don't really know what's wrong. And if, if I really need to get in, if I'm in a hurry, you know, what, what am I going to do? Do I have to, you know, I have to, to go and find someone? So the other thing that people actually, so sort of people's context-based reasoning is they're also, a lot of them were saying, I don't like putting my face on the internet for something that I don't think requires high security. Even though in this case, it didn't actually pass the facial information on, it just, um, it just recognized them. So, 
um, the, you know, this, this can actually um, sort of like be a nightmare. So the other thing is, is like, you know, maybe there's also something that users can learn and that is like, you know, maybe you can actually learn to love the password. If you haven't seen this, I recommend thoroughly that you read this. Um, so something that you use every day, you know, when you use it, we, we always ignore the emotional component. And at the moment, we are just sort of like hate, you know, sort of hating passwords because they're difficult and we're failing. But if you read this blog, is there is, an, is another way. So this guy went through a really bad divorce and then um, at, pass, you know, at work on top of all of this, it forced him to change his password. And um, he said, you know, I, I, I couldn't focus, I couldn't get on, you know, um, I needed to do something. And then I decided my password was going to become the indicator. Um, it, it reminded me that I shouldn't let myself be the, the victim of this breakup, you know, that I'm strong enough to do something about it. So my password became, I forgive her. And so every time when I entered it, you know, I was thinking, I forgive her. And he describes in this story of how this helped him to recover and get over the breakup. You know? So you might think that is extreme, but it shows a creative way of how you can turn, turn some, you know, that there are actually sometimes ways of turning something that's quite annoying into something positive. Um, and um, I think we can, we can do that. So to summarize, um, Really, I think the things that will kill the password is if we keep banging on and insisting on length and strength, right? That is not, you know, people just, just can't cope it. You know, they've had it with the mental gymnastics and long-winded entry procedure. It's, it's draining far too much productivity. Um, if we keep on insisting on that, people are definitely going to desperately look for alternatives, you know, where there isn't a password figuring in it. The password expiry is particularly egregious, you know, and um, it's, it's really the consequences of, of uh, when you then fail following a password expiry. Either you fail because you can't create a valid new password or you, you do create a valid new password, but then in the, it's very, very brittle in the first couple of days after change. You know, the old password is much stronger than the new one. And if you fail, then you end up like my colleague, um, Mark Harmon, who is a professor at UCL, who basically sent this long email to the computer center at the, at the weekend saying, you know, um, yesterday I updated my password in response to the cyclic request due to password aging policy. Um, as is well known with password aging, you know, if you, know, you, if you write down your password, which of course I did, the system rejected several of my attempts to construct a new password um, that met the constraints which are only revealed to the user once they are broken. I wrote down the final password that was accepted after these attempts. However, I still can't, something went wrong. I can't log in, you know, and I'm now um, logged out, you know, and um, I, can't, um, I can't get back in. And basically, this is the photo of him at the help desk on Monday morning, right? And here's like a quick illustration of a computer science professor, you know, not getting his paper, his, his stuff done over the weekend and then having to queue for 20 minutes at the help desk to, to get it reset, right? If people um, experience that, um, they're not going to be very happy. Now, help comes in the, unlikely in the unlikely guise of these guys. You see at the logo, the logo at the, at the bottom, CESG, um, which is of course here, which is in here in the UK responsible for setting standards for information assurance. They're part of the big evil agency that we dare not mention around here. Um, but what they, have, what they actually did following collaboration with myself and, and Cormac Hurley um, is they issued these new guidelines which actually do the things that I'm recommending now. They, they're recommending the same thing. So they say don't expire passwords unless it's, it's absolutely necessary. Um, the owners of systems should take responsibility for protecting passwords files properly and they should employ additional monitoring on systems rather than piling all the work, or all the protection onto the passwords um, and so on. And it came out in September, end of September. And if you look at the trade press, the um, response to, to, to this document has been, that is so sensible. <laughs> 
<laughs> people said slightly incredulously, um, but it shows that it can be done. And um, hopefully this is, is the start of a road of actually, because they're very clearly set in this document, you've got to work with your users, you know, don't demonize them, don't just dump all the stuff on them, help them to do the right thing, make it possible for them to do the right thing and work together because the real enemy is out there and not inside. Right? So I think that's a, that's a very good thing. So um, what will keep passwords alive is if it's easy enough to do, people, un, you know, they're used to passwords, they understand them, and as long as you don't make it impossible for them, they are actually quite happy to use them. And they feel in control, and some people use them for like, you know, for self-therapy, self-medication, great, right? Then they, um, they'll stick with them. So um, they will only work if you use them often enough to, 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 to basically make them a habit um, and, and make them automatic. So we should take infrequently used authentication sets out of the equation, put them to one side and put different mechanisms, whether that's a one-time or a graphical authentication or whatever, onto them. Um, the, we should basically look at where the authentication occurs independent of the mechanism, less of a disruption will overall um, create, create much less, less pain and make people use it. And of course, if we put this onto, if we basically work um, with devices, if we put a second layer onto it, whether that is the biometric or whether we use it to deliver the one-time code, such as Google Authenticator. You know, if most of your, your users are smartphone users, you know, people who are never separated from their smartphone um, and constantly connected, that's fine, that'll work, um, that'll work for them. Um, but there needs to be, the recovery needs to be faster, there needs to be reassurance um, and, and a fallback, you know, and spending 20 minutes or half an hour in the queue um, on, on a call center help desk is not a viable alternative. I mean, I'm going like, for God's sake, right? Even you don't even need, if you lose your card or have your card stolen, you can still go to a cash machine and get money out, right? Because they've developed a fallback for that. Is surely we can do that for, to let people into systems where the risk is, is significantly less than, um, than, than in terms of the money. You know, you can, you can take a similar risk-based approach if you limit what people can do. You know, maybe you shouldn't always, you should even let them in when they, when they can't get it. So sometimes, um, or you do additional payload if you basically get authentication and and um, uh, transaction verification all in one, such as the systems have now, um, they're now deployed in Germany and in um, the Netherlands for online banking, Stephen Murdoch's um, Kronto system. You know, there again, it's like, you know, then people actually quite happily go and say, okay, yeah, let me read this through and make sure it's okay before I push the button and con confirm it. Um, because you know that even you know this is this will protect you even against the pretty evil man in the browser attacks um, that otherwise catch catch a lot of solutions out. So um, that's basically my prediction. So I think unless we really mess it up, passwords aren't dead. They will become part of new easy to use solutions. And um, that's here's to hoping that people will stop hating them and just use them as a part of their everyday practice. Thank you very much.